Good afternoon, and welcome to the Space Lab Speaker Series event. My name is Alicia Tropak, and I am the Director of Transformation for ADCO, and I will be your moderator today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional territories and original caretakers of the land where we make our living and enjoy the abundance of the land with our friends and family. I am honored to live and work in Treaty 7, the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Nitsit Dibi, comprised of the Siksika, Kainai, Bigani Nations, the Sutena Nation, the Stony Nakoda Nation, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary, Mokinstis, is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present in the communities and regions where we operate. This lecture is the fifth lecture in the ACO Speaker Series this year. These lectures are a chance for ADCO to share knowledge and insights from thought leaders, providing our colleagues and our network of peers, partners, and friends with information on promising developments, trends, and leadership in exciting and relevant fields. In addition to presenting the ADCO Space Lab Speaker Series, ADCO's transformation team also leads ADCO Space Lab. Space Lab is an enterprise-wide framework of collaborative support for the creative energy of our colleagues. Space Lab is a source of funding and expertise for any ADCO employee wanting to test and achieve sustainable new value for the company and our customers. And we've supported the achievements of over 100 project teams since the fall of 2019. We previously heard from Dr. Jaina Hallroy Leduc from the University of Calgary. In case you missed it, please visit ACO's YouTube channel for a recording. Our next lecture will be held on November 30th with Dr. Michael Hart from the University of Calgary. Before we get underway with today's lecture, I would like to remind you all that this session is a one way video in audio format. You may ask questions by using the question icon at the right of your screen and we will open up this functionality roughly midway through the lecture. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by Dr. Misha Kirchhoff, who will tell us how advances in our artificial intelligence using quick, automated thinking can be applied to complex problems whose solutions require conscious and effortful thinking. These two modes of thought are called system one and system two thinking. His talk will include examples from epidemiology, the simulation of turbulent flows, and of particular interest to us at ACO, applying physics-informed machine learning to energy systems, including electricity and gas transmission systems. Dr. Kirchhoff is a professor of mathematics and is the chair of the Graduate Interdisciplinary Program, GIPDP, in Applied Mathematics at the University of Arizona. He attained his master's from the Nova Brisk State University and his PhD from the Wiseman Institute of Science. Prior to his current position, he held a fellowship at Princeton and an Oppenheimer Fellowship and Staff position at Los Alamos National Laboratory. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Misha Kirchhoff. Over to you. Okay, hello, and I hope you can hear me now. Uh, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry, I was, I was muted. Uh, do you hear me now? Very well, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so very um, excited to be here. Uh, unfortunately, not in person. Um, and yeah, so I attempted to come to Calgary, and I did, but uh, I missed my, uh, well, flight was... Uh, Screwed, so I uh, was not able to present on July 25th, so presenting today over Zoom. I'll be talking about uh, System 2 Applied Mathematics. Uh, and yes, I'm uh, 
professor of applied mathematics at the University of Arizona Tucson. So uh, applied mathematics, that's what I'm doing uh, for living, teaching and doing research. And um, uh, so what is system two uh, and system one? Uh, because, well, whenever there is system two, there should be system one. I am uh, guessing that some of you uh, read this book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, who is a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And that's terminology is from, uh, from him. It also was picked up by AI uh, researchers uh, recently, in particular uh, Joshua Benjo in his uh, plenary at Neural IPS, was mentioning it and was mentioning it uh, in the context of uh, getting deep learning to uh, which is in the frontier of AI uh, to the next level, system two level. And that's um, what I am uh, will be discussing today. Uh, and uh, for uh, setting a stage, uh, what we need to know about system one and system two, system one is uh, uh, when we operate automatically, uh, think quickly, uh, and system two is when we need to uh, switch on uh, attention. Uh, it's basically about uh, effortful mental activities. So now uh, projecting it to AI, uh, deep learning uh, in my books, um, and of course in part with automatic differentiation is more like system two. And my books being books of uh, somebody who is using AI, uh, even though I'm developing it, but in this context for me, uh, in the context of today talks, I'll be using it. And uh, that's, uh, contrasted with what we might call system two, uh, which is uh, physics and formal machine learning. It's a term which I like to use. Uh, well, if I want to be a little bit more uh, general and going beyond physics, it's just explainable heuristics. And uh, it may be in any sciences, not necessarily physical sciences, engineering as well. So now, uh, uh, I uh, punchline for my talk is that uh, applied mass and specifically applied mass with its uh, classic tools such as uh, ODS, PDS and sensitivity analysis. It's actually a connector. It's something in between and sometimes it may be turned into uh, kind of automatic thinking, uh, but sometimes we uh, focus on uh, how to uh, basically um, uh, then it becomes uh, develop it and then it becomes system two. Uh, what uh, what is my plan for today? I'll start by uh, giving you so there will be three topics which I'll discuss and uh, depending on how it progress in terms of time, I may um, uh, I may uh, do it uh, a little bit uh, well will adjust uh, adjust to uh, to how it'll progress. Uh, I'll start with power systems and then uh, I'll be discussing uh, uh, fluid mechanics. Uh, and uh, if time permits, we'll be also discussing epidemiology. In terms of uh, power systems, and uh, yes, I'm doing energy system broader. Uh, today, I'll not be discussing natural gas networks. I'll not be discussing district heating system, even though I'll be delighted to discuss it uh, later on offline. But uh, in the context of power system, uh, what is uh, physics and form uh, machine learning for power system? Uh, that is uh, kind of highlighted in this slide. Uh, it's uh, highlighted in context of um, uh, kind of um, sentences or statements which we can uh, we would like to make. Uh, we uh, and uh, our desiderata. Uh, so in power system computations, we want to be uh, efficient. Uh, we want to do computations. Specifically, I'm talking about computations, modeling of power system faster, and. Um, even if you don't have complete measurements. Uh, of course, we do need measurements and uh, we are discussing uh, measurements in particular coming from uh, what is called phaser measurement uh, unit technology. Uh, but we also rely quite a lot on solvers, on uh, solvers which uh, existed in this field uh, for a long while. And that's what is the uh, uh, main um, framework for everything we do in the power system. And now uh, turning about turning back to the system to system one uh, informed or agnostic about power system thinking uh, is uh, today uh, is uh, is basically how we live it through. Uh, we uh, often switch to new uh, neural network based technologies 
and that's uh, I'll mention a few of those. Uh, but as a traditional engineer, so physicist or uh, applied mathematicians working in those fields, we also very much want to rely on existing uh, knowledge. And now question is how to uh, mix all of that. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Of course, options are many, uh, methods are many, and uh, so it will be just a snapshot, little snapshot uh, of um, what a uh, community is involved uh, with. And here I, I'm giving very brief, um, uh, well, recent and biased uh, review, a review uh, not even in detail. So I don't even want to go through mentioning all of that uh, enough to show it as a slide. What I, however, wanted to emphasize at this and next slide is that um, we are kind of all over the map in terms of the system one, system two, or for that matter, mix, juxtaposition of those two. So green, uh, uh, so what you see here is a, a research project which my, myself, my team, and uh, other researchers in the field were uh, involved um, and uh, relatively recent since 2016. And uh, green uh, indicates where the starting point was more or less power system modeling, but we uh, tried to uh, embed in this modeling uh, what, um, uh, what AI, what modern uh, well, uh, AI and machine learning uh, developed. Uh, red is uh, when we go uh, other way. So we basically uh, kind of forget first uh, all this knowledge which we have uh, for generations and uh, we have input output relations uh, in terms of data and we try to uh, build neural network uh, assuming that we of course we put intelligence in asking questions but not much into uh, how we build those models and so our models are system one models but there may be uh, situations which are in between and by the way uh, in a discussion which preceded this uh, presentation uh, asha i'm sorry nisha uh, ask me about uh, uh, PIN, physics and for neural network. They are actually in a list, but under another name, collocation for neural ODE, and that's how I view it. And that's actually a paper which applies PINs to a uh, power system. Uh, well, uh, that's extension of a list. And uh, now I want to get to this exemplary uh, research which we've been doing, and that's the last paper. And uh, this is a team. Uh, which, uh, which is behind the story. Uh, so Laurent, he is a postdoc with me. Uh, Julian is student with Philippe, and Philippe is in, uh, in Switzerland. And that's a paper which was in IEEE access uh, recently accepted. So now, a uh, uh, key story here is about uh, model reduction. That's a buzzword which uh, you should kind of pin uh, associate with this part of my story. Uh, we are interested in developing reduced models. So why reduced? Because we want to uh, uh, we want to compute fast. Our computation should be light. Uh, well, we are ready to give up a little bit, but not a lot of accuracy. And of course, we want to um, uh, to make it based on ground truth. We want to validate it. Uh, that's a kind of uh, schematics of uh, everything we do in AI and machine learning, but now I'll be doing it in a kind of traditional way. Uh, I'll be uh, attempting to reduce this uh, basic model, which is very standard uh, kind of working horse of power system dynamics, and that's what I'll, I'm discussing, how power grid is evolving. Uh, I'll, I'll detail what this equation means on the next slide, but for now, it is a basic uh, system of ODEs defined to a network uh, called swing equations. Again, it's a working horse of power system. And I want to develop something uh, which I can uh, run much faster and uh, still uh, predict and still be able to um, figure out what dynamics, uh, what, what why next uh, a few minutes maybe will be in a power system. So that's uh, my reduced model. And OK, so what are options? And uh, I'll be sending you uh, a bit unusual option. And uh, I choose this uh, topic, subtopic of many, uh, to illustrate uh, kind of maybe not very traditional thinking. And my, uh, well, uh, approach to that um, will be to go from system of ODEs 
So something which we would normally consider a much more complicated system of PDEs. And I'll be sending it to reduce model. So you see that now my uh, well theta surfaces, and now they are not over grid, but they're at a particular point in space and in time. So now it's PD in space and time. And uh, okay, so uh, and why uh, partial differential equation uh, modeling, which is normally we would consider more complicated than uh, ordinary system of ordinary differential equation is a sound option. So that's one um, question which, um, uh, well, uh, teaser, so which, which I, I'd like you to think about. And um, yeah, so uh, normally, naively, you would say that it doesn't have much of a sense. You increase number of degrees of freedom because we immediately think about PDEs as, as, as really, uh, well, uh, we have a function involved in space and time that was continuous before you had a uh, set of uh, characteristics of grid phases uh, at a particular point evolving in time. Well, um, uh, here I'm kind of switching on my system too, and I'm trying to make a case for, for actually using PDE uh, as uh, very efficient and much, uh, much more reliable, but also uh, uh, sensible and um, explainable version, a version which uh, power system engineers should be quite comfortable and uh, uh, also allowing to kind of see it. And yeah, I, I hopefully uh, will illustrate it in a, in a minute. So now why? Uh, well, uh, when we think about two dimensional, uh, in this case, it will be in two dimensional. And two dimension is a, uh, our uh, well, a uh, special footprint, uh, you'll see some map of Europe because my collaborators are from Switzerland will illustrate it on power grid of uh, Europe. And uh, so it will be two plus one dimensional PD, but we'll regularize it, right? So we discretize it. And uh, actually number of grid points, which we'll use to show you uh, as a continuum in two dimension will be fewer than number of points which uh, actual power grid uh, modelers are using in a swing equation type of modeling. So that's one advantage. Uh, and um, another, uh, well, uh, I'll be first transitioning to T 2D, but then I'll be using regular lattice. And regular lattice, uh, well, tons of uh, methods and, uh, well, generations of uh, research in applied mathematics um, actually uh, taught us how to do it much more efficiently in the lattice than on a, on a graph. And uh, also, and probably most importantly, number of physical parameters. Parameters, what I mean by physical, they all have physical interpretation as opposed to parameters in neural networks, which don't, uh, which cannot be allowed uh, in a kind of, in, in terms of, uh, in this case, power uh, uh, accepted in power engineering. Uh, so number of those physical parameters, uh, they all will be intuitive, will be actually fewer. So in this regard, uh, I'll be uh, training my system uh, with fewer parameters. So that's uh, why uh, we, uh, we, we are doing it this way. Okay, so uh, now I uh, will walk you through what some details of what we are doing. There is uh, prehistory. So we are not the first to uh, think about modeling um, power system as a PD, even though before it was primarily uh, for a power system which are elongated, like maybe um, Eastern interconnect in the United States, which goes uh, along uh, Pacific uh, shore of the US and actually goes all the way to uh, um, to British Columbia, uh, well, that may be modeled as one dimensional system, but many other power systems are not really one dimensional, like Europe, the two dimensional. So there is some prehistory behind these ideas, but never uh, put in the context of reduced modeling uh, in, in full, uh, as far as we know. So now, um, how we can make it work? Uh, I'll not go into details, I'll show you some, uh, well, basically briefly argue and uh, then show you a couple of results and then move on to the next topic. Uh, swing equations, so swing equations are discussing, describing uh, evolution of phase at uh, nodes of my grid. And uh, think about power grid of Europe, you'll see a picture very soon. Uh, 
so we have uh, m is a uh, coefficients of inertia d uh, are coefficients of so-called dumping um, we have uh, injection of power we have voltages and we have sus susceptance of lines and uh, so that's uh, is replaced by reduced model and reduced model is pde and now you see uh, that we have a instead of graph we have a continuum and uh, instead of graph Laplacian, which is what uh, actually would be associated with the sign term, we have a, a graph Laplacian in PDE with a, a well kind of high anisotropic diffusion coefficients. Quite a lot of details uh, in, in, this, um, in this box. So now, of course, there are all the details related to boundary conditions. I'm talking about grid and I need to now continuum, right? So I need to inject boundary conditions. Okay, so let me uh, now show a picture and you, you can maybe relate to what I'm saying to, uh, to, to actual problem. So that's a Europe and now you, you see it as a, uh, uh, well, uh, two-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional, uh, well, domain with boundaries and boundaries are quite tricky and uh, you need to define um, boundary conditions and then uh, we have evolution. And uh, boundary conditions also require introducing, uh, well, a proper um, initialization, which would be consistent with boundary conditions. Some detail of that uh, you see in the box on the right. So we are using actually, we are not inventing uh, a lot of this classic stuff. So we are reusing it, but now we're using it maybe in a little bit, mm, well, uh, in a new way, not, not very traditional way. So now um, jumping to what you can achieve. Uh, and uh, model which we compare with is so-called pentagonal model. It's a model of European power system which uh, Laurent, who is uh, first author on this paper, uh, was developed during his PhD, and his PhD is from EPFL. Uh, and we are contrasting it with this new model which we built and uh, calibrate, so train. Uh, on uh, Pantagruel data, and Pantagruel is for us, for us is a ground truth. So that's a kind of characteristics of this ground truth, how many generators we have, how many lines, etc. Uh, so now, uh, and we, how to illustrate uh, advantage uh, of our PD modeling? Well, look at this uh, blue line and red line, and those are predictions. So imagine that you have a, a, a well, a, uh, in this case, it's of course synthetic, it's not real. So we have um, a big perturbation. So a power plant uh, somewhere um, in Greece is removed. And uh, then you have a wave, electromechanical wave, which propagates. Uh, electromechanical wave propagates roughly with a speed of 500 kilometers per second, so it's pretty fast. So blue uh, is, um, uh, well, um, okay, so you need to contrast this blue and red. And uh, no. so red uh, is um, oversimplified modeling, which you would get if you would put a very simplistic uh, kind of assumptions, completely homogeneous assumptions. And red is what our train model is giving. And that's basically illustrating uh, how significant this difference is. So difference is, um, is actually uh, quite large on this big power system. Okay. One. One second, sorry about that. Okay, so now uh, getting to um, to maybe punchline uh, and switching to, to another subject, another illustration, uh, we can uh, do quite a lot of uh, stuff with this model. And this model in particular, we can predict um, kind of steady state. We always should consider this ground truth. We all also have a quite a a challenge in terms of uh, training or adjusting parameters. What we did so far, adjustment was uh, relatively uh, not sophisticated, but all of those parameters which we had here have been physical. So we really didn't yet use much of neural networks, even though that's what we are planning to do. And uh, well, that's another example. So here we've been following a um, result of uh, this um, uh, well, uh, insult to the power system is uh, uh, serious fluctuations of frequency. And uh, you see how our model, which is a solid line, so in all those cases predicted uh, how frequency develops, frequency deviation from nominal, 
uh, goes as a function of time, a different location in Europe. And yeah, so that's um, kind of validation. So we didn't uh, train our system to, to deliver these physical results, but that's what we are checking. And uh, okay, so there are some number of other details. Uh, so let me maybe jump over those and uh, get to punchline for this part of the talk. So what I um, uh, wanted to explain in here is that uh, yes, so we can uh, go with a construction. We can reduce. Uh, we can use uh, this very unusual idea of uh, uh, reduce model based on PDEs. So first, complicate to a degree because PDEs are more complicated. But then um, simplify and simplify through uh, uh, introducing proper uh, well sparse uh, grids and uh, having few degrees of freedom uh, to train and setting uh, initial conditions and boundary condition proper. Uh, so there is some validation and uh, we. Uh, well, uh, we are realistic in terms of uh, kind of uh, checking uh, how how good or bad this uh, model uh, performs. It certainly uh, can be used for course description. It's certainly uh, quite promising. However, there are a lot of improvements which can be made, and in particular, more learning or more of these neural networks. Uh, so now, um, and that's exactly what we are doing. So we are, uh, well, uh, getting uh, help from system one through neural network to train parameters in our PD model. So I didn't show you uh, much on that. I already have some results, but that's for those who are interested. I'll, I'll be, I'll be happy to discuss those. And um, uh, so now, in terms of uh, kind of longer term goal. Uh, we uh, want uh, very efficient computations because uh, because we want to do faster than real time. That's terminology used in power system. So we want um, um, also to evaluate multiple scenarios and do it fast. And that's why all this uh, all this bus, all these approaches. So now a punchline for my system one uh, and a half, I guess, uh, closer to two uh, uh, story. Here is that uh, classic applied mathematics, in this case PDE. Uh, well, uh, it is uh, trustworthy. So uh, it is spoiler in the sense that uh, we are injecting not traditional methods, but it doesn't necessarily need to be based on neural networks. But neural networks can help and can help altogether. Goal is when we, why we start from a kind of classic applied math. We want to be explainable. Everything here is in terms of well physical power system terms we also want to be intuitive and uh, well you you can easily test things like advance of this um, um, insult um, uh, frontier which uh, through through the europe and uh, yes in the end of the day we wanted to be on ai steroids so far the only steroids we use we use automatic differentiation because that's how we train our physical parameters uh, and we do it much faster than, let's say, we would do 10 years ago, five years ago, but uh, we are yet, uh, we are basically putting it as well or, uh, uh, right now on a neural network steroids. Okay, uh, so now um, I'm switching to my uh, second topic. And my second topic um, is, um, well, uh, maybe uh, of a little bit less of interest for this audience, but um, um, well, I'm guessing you guys uh, deal with um, turbulence in many of your applications, so that's still maybe uh, overused. And uh, this is a team which is behind the second story, so it's mainly between Los Alamos. That's where I've uh, been working for 20 years, moved to Arizona four years ago. And my two students are kind of in between uh, my current location and my past location, and um, in Los Alamos is Daniel. Uh, Levesco and Chris Fryer for leading it, and on the Arizona side is Misha Stepan helping. People behind this work are mainly Michael, Kristen, and Yifan. Yifan is a postdoc at Los Alamos. Okay, so um, um, we are talking about uh, turbulence. It is rather academic research which I am presenting, but uh, here the uh, kind of uh, Game is also about computational efficiency, about getting beyond this, uh, uh, well, uh, very large Reynolds numbers and practical, uh, 
complications, but complications which we have in uh, aerodynamics of uh, well, uh, jets uh, and then uh, modeling atmosphere or uh, getting, uh, well, there are plenty of applications as you can guess. And uh, of course, in turbulence and fluid mechanics, we have generations and generations uh, of uh, applied mass modeling and uh, usually, well, uh, Reynolds average navi stocks is uh, probably one classic. We also have legend simulations, so all of those will be mentioned. And I'll also be uh, kind of in the spirit of what I'm discussing, uh, suggesting something new and actually putting much more of neural network uh, steroids into that than in the previous story. That's, this slide is a Kirka of 2016. It's basically when we've been putting this proposal together, uh, we call it uh, uh, machine learning for turbulence. Uh, that was our vision, so multiple applications on the front end. And um, well, uh, we wanted, uh, it was a beginning of machine learning uh, kind of uh, entrance into uh, many, well, physics and engineering disciplines, and we certainly wanted to get advantage of that. In the first uh, years of this project, um, we actually been pretty much a learn and I'll tell you, Ellerian is uh, in the terminology of fluid mechanics, Ellerian when you look uh, after fields and not particles. Particles would be Lagrangian and that's the uh, um, um, main uh, part of this uh, story which I'll be presenting. But uh, we first went through quite uh, well significant uh, Ellerian um, discussion and the logic was, uh, well, um, it's a logic which I try to follow in all my research. So first of all, when we decided to, to use uh, AI machine learning, we started uh, with putting questions which we want AI to answer. And this is where, uh, in this case, physics of um, turbulence enters. So we develop uh, quite, quite advanced diagnostics. And then we started with this physics-free, just neural networks approach uh, to answering those questions. But as we go, we uh, moved more and more into uh, well, physics and form. And now I'm discussing something which is much more physics and form than what we uh, used to have before. Uh, and now it will also be Lagrangian. Okay, so I already gave you a hint on what Lagrangian is. It's um, particles versus fields. So field would be velocity or vorticity or whatever other, uh, uh, well, characteristics, which is um, in this case, uh, describe evolution. Uh, of uh, in a, of three dimensional space, but you can also see uh, particles, and you can follow how particles behave, and you can think about those particles as kind of probing your turbulence, and uh, you can also um, then discuss or attempt to build Lagrangian models. So that's what we are up to in this case, and. Um, um, so now uh, let me. Um, focus uh, and try to give you kind of, uh, well, essence of what we are doing. There are many details I'm not talking. Uh, so here, uh, this field is, um, well, maybe even more developed from a point of view applied mass and power systems. So in power system, we have maybe 40 years. Um, in uh, turbulence modeling, we probably have, well, depending on how you count, maybe 300 years. There is a lot of stuff behind. But um, let me uh, jump in uh, and um, um, well carry it on. So basically explain what we are doing and then uh, comment on um, you know what we can achieve and what, what are further plans. So we are building what uh, those who work in turbulence would be uh, should consider uh, Lagrangian large eddy simulation. So large eddy simulation is a standard term. It's an attempt to build reduced models. I've already been mentioning reduced models in uh, power system, but now in fluid mechanics, of course, uh, reduced models are even more important because number of degrees of freedom, uh, which are um, uh, governing uh, how fluid flows in a turbulent regime, there are many more than in the power system. And now uh, I put this Lagrangian, so that's a novelty. And uh, yeah, so I'll uh, expressing it through particles. It's not a standard approach. So main idea is uh, to build, uh, instead of uh, Navier-Stokes equations, which uh, basic equation of fluid mechanics explaining turbulence, 
so now, which is PDE. Now I am going to system of ODEs and ODEs uh, associated with particles, particles moving in this velocity field. And I'll try to, those particles, uh, they're not just advected, those are effective particles, particles which will be representing actual flow for me. And F is, uh, well, I may put a lot of uh, guesses in this F. Uh, so number of degrees of freedom will be significantly less than in other stocks. And I'll need to guess. I'll need. To, I cannot derive it. And uh, story is about how you, uh, what are guesses, and what you put in this F. And F is a, uh, yeah, need to be uh, uh, modeled. And uh, then I need to train it on ground truth. And ground truth, and in this situation, is usually direct numerical simulation. Uh, well, I have some physical constraints. I already start to put uh, quite a lot of physics uh, at, a, at a, a level of uh, defining uh, this system of equations. There is translational rotational invariance, conservation of momentum, uh, artificial viscosity. Uh, actually, list is longer. So now, um, and here you see this NN, which is neural network appear, appearing. Basically, uh, my starting point here is to a degree much more uh, towards system one, but I'm putting uh, still quite a lot of system two, which is now physics informed part. That's what I'm calling system two. And um, I'm basically putting neural networks um, and uh, this is a way to write neural networks. So I'm, I need to define what does it do. And in this case, you should think about neural network uh, in the context of supervised learning, input output. And uh, so neural network is a function which is parameterized. But uh, function of what? Uh, and this is the right hand side of my equations, right? So in this sense, it is a neural ODEs with uh, some specific uh, assumptions. And now uh, I put um, quite a lot of physics or thinking in terms of uh, how I split what I know or what I don't know. You might pay attention to the fact that, for example, this AD viscosity, I model it in a very physics way, in a very understandable way. Invariance, which I put, uh, I map those uh, output of, of neural network, uh, which are densities and velocities at the position of my particles, uh, by, from uh, other observations, which are also which are positions of particles, velocities, and densities. But I express it through uh, well, what I call invariance, and again, so a lot of well, quite a lot of thinking is put in this structure. But uh, freedom too, so this structure is expressed through neural networks. And um, uh, well, uh, I'm actually doing it uh, also uh, in a, well, uh, not only I should be able to do it for particles, but in the end of the day, I'm uh, modeling uh, fields and fields are velocity fields, which is affected by another stocks. I need to uh, introduce a map from one to another. And that is achieved by designing this kernel, uh, smoothing kernel, which goes, allows me to go from particles to fields. Uh, well, here you already see some elements of machine learning, uh, but now in a kind of physics and for machine learning. Well, to train, uh, so it will be a lot of parameters, the set of stand for parameters, in particular of this uh, kernel. Uh, to train uh, my model, I need to introduce what we call loss function, minimize loss function. And terms in loss functions, they represent different level, different physics. Uh, so, um, well, uh, relation between uh, velocities in one frame, in the uh, Lagrangian frame, and the Lorentz frame. Then uh, you can also take care about, uh, or care about uh, velocity gradients, which are characteristics which uh, for quite a lot of modeling is important. And you might, uh, you, you have here a regularizer. So that's uh, uh, when you look, uh, learn a smoothing kernel. So now, um, okay, I think it is uh, somehow, uh, I don't know why, okay. Yeah. Um, so now uh, we do learning in this problem in two steps. So I already mentioned smoothing kernel. Uh, so there is this uh, Lagrangian Lachey dissimulations, which I want to learn. And um, uh, well, this is a case uh, which we analyze. And uh, this is uh, for different uh, Mach numbers. Uh, so Mach numbers is a, uh, they measure, well, it's a compressible flows and uh, level of compressibility is relatively small, but still different. We also play with different Reynolds numbers and we play with a uh, well different what is called Kolmogorov scale, small scale in the problem. 
So now, uh, why did we, did we study all those cases? Because um, we, we wanted to do not only uh, interpolation, uh, so uh, predict uh, characteristics in the same regime which we are training, but also extrapolate to, to other regimes. Okay, so I probably should speed up a little bit. Um, so there are, well, what you see here is uh, uh, details of how uh, you perform after training. And the point uh, here to make is that you need to be creative in terms of choosing, um, uh, well, your loss function. So I, uh, when I describe a kernel uh, loss function, I was uh, emphasizing that they have three terms. Uh, so one, regularization is over present, but proportion between those two uh, may change the result. And uh, so you, you also should be, um, uh, should, should uh, basically care about that as well. And by the way, this cubic spline is some very naive, uh, well, naive, but uh, what people are using in this discipline, uh, cubic spline uh, way of um, checking a uh, kernel. And uh, well, um, comparison, and that's maybe this slide should give you a sense of what we are doing uh, when we evaluating results. Uh, so we have a top, uh, which is um, um, what we uh, predict, and then uh, we have a, a bottom, and that's a bottom, uh, okay, so uh, both top and bottom. Um, so here, uh, you have a prediction uh, based on different loss functions. And, um, uh, well, this is a ground truth, and um, this, uh, this would be, uh, well, ground truth is in here, sorry. Uh, there is a ground truth for velocity, ground truth for velocity gradient. And then there are predictions for different loss functions. So ground truth on the left and on the right, you have a, a different results of training. And you see that even though for velocity, you may be performing pretty well. This is a snapshot of velocity, which you predict, and that's a reality. But uh, depending on what you want to achieve, and that comes from physics, the velocity gradient may be uh, really screwed. Uh, if your uh, choice of a loss function is not appropriate for this object. Okay, so now uh, the second part of learning is actually training um, uh, this uh, right-hand side of equations, and uh, there are quite a lot of details in here, also in terms of choosing a loss function, but let me jump over that. And I don't know why I'm not getting a good uh, projection. Yeah, so I think, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, so now um, here I, uh, as a part of presenting my results, a part of uh, explaining what we are achieving here, um, when we uh, test, uh, well, in the results, first uh, we learn, we train, and then we test uh, this overall scheme. We uh, already mentioned extrapolation, right? So we want to uh, train our model in one regime and go into another. And uh, those uh, uh, transition from interpolation to extrapolation is something which is with neural network is extremely difficult. It's practically never possible. Talking about um, kind of brute force using neural networks and sciences. However, here, because we use quite a lot of structure and equations, we've been able to do it very well. Oh, reasonably well, uh, when we delay, try to predict turbulence a few steps ahead and we are not putting in training what, what will uh, happen um, next, and then um, uh, over different uh, velocity gradients. We also um, uh, generalize in terms of statistics and statistics in, in terms of different regimes. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, jumping over uh, some of those. So here, basically, there are a few slides which I'm kind of uh, putting under rock, and that's um, ground truth comparison, and comparison uh, is what uh, our uh, Lagrangian lecture dissimulations are giving for different characteristics, uh, and that's in the context of extrapolation. So let me uh, maybe get uh, to benchmark. Well, before that, um, and um, I'm not going to explain what this so-called QR plane is, but the point is that there is this native for this field of fluid mechanics, uh, very rich and uh, fancy uh, tests, which were developed uh, in a pre-AI period, and that's what we are sticking to. And we are uh, using this hybrid model to basically test uh, 
uh, well, uh, test uh, uh, what uh, what um, fluid mechanics people or turbulence models would understand very well. And here again, we compare ground truths with the prediction of our models. Okay, so uh, conclusions from this part. And um, now um, I was discussing Lagrangian uh, as a model reduction. Uh, it was uh, physics transparent, uh, mathematically simpler. Uh, well, that's why we choose Lagrangian, because Lagrangian uh, delivers quite a lot of uh, additional information which you uh, don't see in Illyrian. So that was coming from physics again. So now um, we empowered it by deep learning. Uh, so that was system one uh, thinking. And um, we also uh, now jump to system two accounted for symmetries. And uh, we injected the heuristics. I didn't um, uh, tell you much about uh, uh, a technique which uh, is called smooth particle hydrodynamics. It's also Lagrangian techniques, probably most advanced Lagrangian techniques in this field in the, uh, modeling uh, fluid mechanics. And it has this right hand side in my equations, which is much more detailed, much more physical, uh, probably over constrained. So we also tested parameters of smooth particle hydrodynamics. So that's putting uh, putting more physics than uh, what I showed you through neural network. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was this um, way of uh, uh, splitting problem into two. And uh, we show that in uh, interpolates well. And uh, diagnostics actually included both Euler and Lagrange. So now uh, I have this cup, some slides uh, about uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics, which I'm jumping over. Maybe one point to make before I go to uh, uh, very briefly next topics, and I'll ask uh, uh, in a minute if I have enough time or not. But here is kind of important, technically important slide. Uh, when you put more physics, you uh, want to take advantage of um, uh, not only automatic differentiation, which actually applies to uh, neural networks, but also um, to whatever we want to optimize, right? So we have loss functions, and if there are physical parameters, we can also minimize loss function, um, taking advantage of automatic differentiation as well. Uh, however, there are also quite a lot of techniques which we have in applied mass, which comes under the name of, uh, well, depending on how you model deterministic or probabilistic way, um, it um, sensitivity analysis, uh, a joint method, uh, and, you know, quite a bunch of other uh, techniques which are associated with all of that. Uh, putting it in, that's uh, what uh, physics will allow you to do. So by physics, I mean, uh, when you put in your, when you have your equations and your equations represent, well, um, in this case, uh, fluid mechanics. And uh, yeah, so I guess um, in terms of summary uh, overall for this part, when I put certainly much more um, uh, level two thinking, um, so we uh, take care about symmetries, we introduce uh, quite a smart model reduction, we use unusual representation, and uh, we put neural networks, but uh, keeping uh, putting them on the top of the structure which we have from a kind of classic applied mass allows us to make it um, gradual uh, in the sense uh, of uh, kind of being trustworthy to uh, uh, fluid mechanics models, but also uh, explainable. And that's uh, rather a rather big advantage, uh, right? So when you explain it and you don't need to basically say that there is a magic black box, which is neural network, that's, that's a big deal. So now uh, in terms of pass forward with that, so of course uh, this team uh, continues to work. Uh, well, explainability I already mentioned. Uh, we um, actually um, ambitiously looking for new physics and uh, new physics and new heuristics, new phenomenologies um, of turbulence and uh, specifically in terms of application domain where we uh, hope to go and we're already going is uh, get more and more into compressible turbulence, which is much uh, less uh, studied. And here a uh, punchline for my system uh, one, system two story. 
So contribution of system one, AI, uh, it basically helps me to inject new life and hopes into physics, in this case, uh, physics of turbines. I uh, was able to uh, do this um, reduce model, build this reduce model, uh, primarily because I have this um, remarkable automatic differentiation capability. Otherwise, uh, there are too many parameters. Uh, Ten years ago, I wouldn't even think about doing it. So now, um, important emphasis uh, on exclusiveness, exclusiveness, uh, inclusiveness, I'm sorry. I may be inclusive, and that's, um, I didn't demonstrate it in full, I tried to, but I may be even more in terms of models which I can account for. I don't need to reject any models which were in the past were maybe trashed, forgotten, I can resurrect them uh, and exclude if they have a sense. Um, uh, yeah, so there are many more phenomenologies which we can now test and not test one after another, but kind of in comparison. Uh, also, uh, it closed the gap. I didn't emphasize that, but uh, those of uh, us who work on this field and uh, both on a kind of theoretical side uh, and on the engineering side, we know that those two communities don't talk to each other. Uh, so that's an opportunity for us to close this gap uh, between um, quite a lot of sophisticated theories, well, turbulence by many considered uh, a last remaining problem of classical physics, and we still don't understand many details of it, but that's from a theory side. On the engineering side, we use it. So now uh, it's our uh, yeah, uh, opportunity to close this gap. And uh, I already mentioned discovering new physics, but I put it in a more uh, kind of uh, bigger framework. Yeah, so that's, um, that's what we hope to do with all of that. And now um, uh, if I can check with uh, those who uh, um, yeah, follow um, a clock, <laughs> uh, how much time do I have? And if I have any time at all for the third topic? Yes, we have um, about five minutes left for the presentation period. Left. But it, sorry to interrupt, but uh, just so uh, the rest of the audience knows, we're having issues with our Q&A box. Um, so if somebody would like to submit a question, uh, you can email uh, nisha.mohan at ACO.com. That's N-I-S-H-A dot M-O-H-A-N at ACO.com. And we can direct those uh, questions to you. But over to you, uh, Dr. Kirchhoff, to, to finish the presentation. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, so it's probably will be faster than five minutes. Um, well, uh, I can go <laughs> uh, much longer. So that's uh, um, a team uh, which is scattered between, uh, well, right now, between uh, mainly between the University of Arizona and uh, uh, San Diego State University. And the uh, main pe person behind that is Misha Krechetov, who, well, used to be in Russia, now in Kazakhstan, for reasons you can guess. Uh, okay, so uh, it started with pandemics and as many of us uh, started for me and actually for this team, um, um, well, I thought to well figure out uh, or well figure out if I can help and uh, how well applied mathematician like me can help uh, possibly uh, uh, well uh, connecting um, well some theoretical, uh, practical and uh, computational um, aspects of the problem. Uh, that's what we've been doing. It resulted in two papers and um, we uh, basically enter this field suggesting a new model and model uh, which is uh, goes under this name geographical model, graphical model. That's what uh, main part of the story. But as we went, we also realized that we need to have this so-called agent based modeling and um, this complicated um, well, slide uh, is uh, emphasizing that you need to have models, uh, expertise, uh, because those models kind of cross many scales from individual person, right, who may be infected and uh, may transmit this affection to population, right? And that's what we wanted to track. So how it develops in population and uh, hopefully prevent, uh, well, predict and prevent. Uh, that was the goal. Um, uh, but also, yeah, expertise on all those levels. That's actually why such a diverse and big team involved. Uh, also, uh, a lot of data. So that's a story about uh, kind of, uh, yeah, dancing between data models uh, and, uh, well, expertise. Um, so now, um, 
In terms of data, didn't want, uh, well, don't have time to discuss it in details, but main point is that since uh, COVID started, of course, not immediately, but uh, uh, we got so much of data uh, on one hand. On the other hand, this data is not necessarily exactly what we need, uh, not in all respects. Maybe what I want to emphasize is this mobility data is absolutely amazing. Uh, so data which uh, allows uh, us uh, not um, tracking each individual person, and uh, of course it should be anonymous, but uh, figure out how many people from a particular community are uh, uh, traveling to, let's say, a, a shop, a type of shop uh, daily, and uh, how much time do they spend, that type of things. Uh, data is important. So now in terms of um, different scales and different um, uh, models. So as I told you, graphical models is something in between. So it's uh, aggregated already. Agent-based models uh, is a working horse of epidemiology and probably you're familiar with comportamental models. I'm not going to go into details and I'll jump just to graphical models because to a degree it helps me to uh, kind of clarify, uh, to explain uh, how uh, AI can help and um, AI again in a science in form of physics, well, if I may uh, call it physics in form context. It is about reduction, model reduction. Uh, however, um, and yes, it is about efficient computations. It is probabilistic in this case. Obviously, uh, a lot of fluctuations, uh, quality of your predictions cannot be, uh, it's not deterministic at all. Uh, well, much less deterministic than power system and probably even more stochastic or uncertain than um, fluid mechanics, which I was discussing. It is about dynamic. Uh, dynamics, uh, on the other hand, there are, uh, yeah, dynamics because we want to know how uh, epidemiology picture evolves. And data-driven, and I cannot emphasize it more. Uh, so basically, right now, uh, we are working uh, quite hard on closing gaps between different levels of modeling data, etc. So what I'll tell you is just, uh, you know, Applied mathematician, maybe even computer scientists take on uh, this problem which all of us face and continue to face. Uh, well, switch gears and can consider kind of hypothetical, um, uh, well, uh, city. And city which I put on grid, so it's really, uh, you know, schematic. So you have infection which is red and then you start counting. And infection, which uh, kind of propagate between nodes, so that's already aggregated. So nodes, think of those as a um, little communities in in Calgary, right? Uh, and uh, so if uh, this community was infected, then maybe in uh, this next uh, day uh, or maybe next few days, uh, well, uh, because there is a link between this community and every community and other community may infected. So you have this so-called independent cascade dynamic model, which is was introduced in the context of a network of influences. Um, and a uh, completely different context. And by the way, this paper is probably one of the most cited uh, on a kind of computer science side, studying a uh, network of influences. Basically, and not going into details, um, we uh, pick up from that, but model was dynamic. We uh, work with the real data, and in this case, it's a data from Seattle. And it's actually here illustrated how this cascade model uh, would work. So you start from infection and then um, in the end of a kind of this cascade, so you stabilize it and whatever uh, nodes are uh, black, they've been infected through this cascade. Uh, and uh, you see this uh, quite an intermittent picture. Okay. Um, so now, um, what we've been able to show, and uh, been able to show that uh, even though uh, there is dynamic model, uh, when we're interested in what uh, will be a result of uh, this cascade propagation, so it will terminate eventually. Uh, so you, uh, you have initial injection, uh, and then uh, there is this pattern which, uh, which becomes infected. Uh, we show that it can be explained by uh, this, uh, what we call graphical model and parameters in the gra graphical model, which is of those of you who are familiar of Ising model type and parameters of those models, uh, pairwise and um, linear, they basically A, have a physical a kind of nice interpretation, but they can also be learned. And that's what we've been doing. So 
uh, in this setting, uh, we more or less put um, a lot of thinking on how we design this model. Then uh, we uh, focus on um, uh, asking the right questions. And question would be, uh, where first, uh, okay, so um, do we have, um, it propagates or not an average? Uh, so uh, if we change parameters, if we put um, uh, constraints, and constraints, uh, uh, well, we basically, well, maybe we vaccinate more, right? Or maybe we put uh, closures. So will it help uh, to uh, to decrease probability of tra transition? And we have some prediction on that. Uh, data driven, so census data, mobility data, CDC data, different uh, cities. Uh, so that's all. Uh, yeah. So I don't have time to discuss it in details. Uh, also have story on how to use it to the next level. So kind of have control, mitigation, prevention. But um, no time, so I'm, I'll be jumping uh, over. <laughs> uh, some discussion, which uh, otherwise, I, if I would have more time, I would probably, yeah, uh, uh, present. So now, um, uh, well, on one hand, uh, conclusion, but on the other hand, pass forward. Uh, we want better and richer inference models. Uh, so now uh, already coarse grain, this graphical models type, uh, but uh, I think uh, type was um, basically uh, and a little bit primitive modeling uh, if there is, uh, if if you are infected and you being um, well uh, part of the city, region of the city uh, or not, uh, of course we want much softer characterization of that. Uh, we want to learn those graphical models, and learning uh, is actually where we'll be using quite a lot of, already started to use quite a lot of neural network. And we also have a uh, pipeline, pipeline not only in terms of um, data, uh, which is also significant, there is a different granularity, but most important for us, pipeline of models. And uh, this agent-based models, which I jump over to graphical models, there is actually something in between those of you who are familiar with queuing models, so that's what we are also building in here. And of course, in the end of the day, we want not only to learn, but predict to infer and infer. And with that, um, uh, let me close. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Uh, this is a slide, um, uh, well, selling my program. So I'm chair of Applied Mass program, so we have 60 uh, plus uh, graduate students, PhD uh, students, and um, uh, we are preparing them. Uh, so it's a PhD program. We are preparing them to, uh, uh, well, go to industry, go to national labs, uh, and uh, carry on. Uh, well, uh, modern applied mathematics and uh, modern applied, well, some sample of modern applied mathematics. That's what I gave to you. And I am also happy to tell you more about the University of Arizona and this, well, infrastructure we have, but I guess no time and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for your presentation and, and your remarks. Um, as I mentioned before, we had uh, some technical issues with our Q&A box. Um, but we do have time for, for one or two questions, um, and, uh, and I can start. Um, Dr. Kirchhoff, you provided some really interesting examples of, of um, physics-inspired um, machine learning models, particularly for power systems, as well as um, turbulence modeling and fluid mechanics. Are there any other applications um, for for this method that you're really excited about or some of your colleagues are are excited about? Uh, there are tons. So um, those three which I picked, they are, uh, uh, well, um, applications uh, I'm working on. Um, I also mentioned graphical models, so that's on a uh, thinking about um, AI uh, as a uh, system to researcher, so that's what I'm doing, so it's a part of AI. Uh, but of course, so literally any um, any, ap any application of applied mathematics, when you have equations uh, and you have, uh, well, knowledge, which was developed for maybe 10 years, maybe for 100 years, uh, based on those equations, that's, um, well, a way you should uh, think um, in a way, uh, well, maybe not exactly how I 
how I uh, was thinking working on my three applications, but somehow in this period. So a lot of, I also should mention that um, a lot of terminology, uh, people don't really fully understand each other. Um, I mentioned this trust, which is very significant. So as a classic research, uh, well, in energy systems, so maybe some of you are modeling natural gas systems and you have a certain, well, it's difficult to start uh, thinking about how uh, to inject AI and what you're doing, but that's kind of starting point, right? So you start from what you know and you, you add on the top of that. Wonderful. So I have one question coming through here. Um, the question is, um, I normally think of physics laws as something that can be displayed in reasonably short equations. What form do you think new physics inspired by AI would take? And is there a portable format for them? Um, okay, so um, that's actually, thank you, very, very good question. And that's an opportunity for me uh, to maybe mention, uh, uh, well, different approaches, right? So uh, neural ODE and now neural PD, uh, that's a, a framework which uh, came from uh, AI researchers. Um, it was a name which was uh, proposed, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, in 2018. And um, uh, well, in this case, it is normally about evolution in time, right? So maybe uh, in space too, but uh, it was um, analogies which uh, this paper uh, and, um, well used was mainly analogy with time. So you have ODE in time, uh, but um, um, well, right hand side was replaced by neural network. So that's um, to a degree you saw it in my presentation. So now this is um, very automatic in the sense that um, uh, you don't need to know a lot, but you need to think about uh, as an engineer or physicist or whatever your application. Yeah, so what are degrees of freedom and uh, do I want to know how they evolve in time? Maybe that will be just enough. And then, uh, yeah, so we have this framework and there is quite a lot of resources uh, on GitHub, right? So neural ODEs and now neural PDs. But, um, uh, well, Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, the more you go into physics <laughs> or engineering, and especially if you want really to relate to uh, your results to what uh, researchers in those fields um, um, are used to and uh, generate it and no, a lot of good stuff. The more you, uh, yeah, you, you need, the more specificity you need to put in this right hand side. And uh, it may be mixed. Um, well, uh, in this, uh, well, in fluid mechanics project, which I talk, uh, we actually had, it, it took us two years or so to, to actually create these models. Uh, while uh, just neural PDE or ODE, uh, probably a skillful um, graduate student can do, well, maybe in a month, <laughs> uh, much faster. Uh, so trade-offs, right? So where, where do you want? To, so therefore, um, it's, it's your decision. And it's in fact, well, if you remember in the beginning of my presentation, when I was showing power system, I was contrasting this, uh, well, system one thinking, um, using neural networks, kind of input output, like industry folks would be using in, a, in by that I mean AI industry folks, uh, uh, versus um, very physics and form, right? So very specific, um, and it was something in between. Uh, that's your choice. <laughs> and you, if you are happy with um, this, yeah, so neural ODE or neural PD, probably you'll get a lot of troubles generalizing. You'll get um, problems with extrapolations, uh, almost certainly. Um, well, it's not guaranteed that other approaches will, will allow you to bypass it, but at least, yeah, you can explain and there is, there is more hope. That's what it is. Thank you for for that. I think we have time for one more question, and um, that question is: What would be the effects of ill, or sorry, 
ill posedness of physical equations and convergence in training for machine learning algorithms? And are there any suggestions on how to choose from those various models discussed based on their capabilities and fitness? Very good, yeah. Um, another remarkable, well, important question. Um, and, um, well, there'll be silver lining, but not silver bullet. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so you can over constrain easily. Uh, I was mentioning in this fluid mechanics portion, I jump over it, uh, this uh, SPH, uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. And um, uh, it's much more uh, constrained. And uh, we, uh, we've been doing it still. We put, um, we generalize it. And again, so that's in the spirit of inclusiveness. Um, you, you, can, you can include many, many models and you can compare them. Uh, so that's probably best best answer. So you uh, you go through entire spectrum, and depending on what you want, if you want just very fast results and practical uh, suggestions, and you have a lot of data in the regime which you're interested in, I would start with a very physics blind approach. But if there is not a lot of data or sometimes no data, uh, um, well, uh, you may also have very good models or maybe not. So now, depending on how much you want to invest in this, or how much creativity you have uh, in those models. So um, comparison, comparison, and kind of data validation. So what what else can we can we do? Well, thank you so much uh, for your remarks and your answers to our questions today. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our ACO colleagues who have helped put this uh, event together. Um, for all of you who have joined us, uh, we very much appreciate your interest in and invite you to watch our social media feeds for information about future Space uh, Lab Speaker Series sessions. A reminder that our next session will be at the end of November with a presentation from Dr. Michael Hart from the University of Calgary. Thank you to everyone who's, uh, who has watched this online. We hope you have a wonderful day.